In my first lecture, I discussed the metaphysical base of objectivism, the recognition of the fact that reality is a firm, objective absolute, that everything which exists possesses identity, that consciousness is the faculty of perceiving and identifying that which exists. Last week, I discussed epistemology. Epistemology is the science that studies the nature of human knowledge. I presented the basic pattern of the structure of man's consciousness. Reason is man's faculty of perceiving reality. The process by which man's consciousness proceeds from sensations to perceptions to the formation of abstractions or conceptions. The nature of the subconscious, the nature of emotions, and the fact that emotions come from man's conscious or subconscious premises. This evening I will continue the discussion of epistemology. I will take up the question of what is thinking, what are the standards of correct reasoning, that is, reasoning which gives us actual knowledge of reality. I will discuss that crucial, most unappreciated science, logic. You have all heard the popular misconceptions of the role and function of logic. Most people believe that logic is some dry, formalistic science, a kind of aimless parlor game for unemployed intellectuals who waste their time quibbling over words. Most people believe that logic at best is unrelated to human existence and at worst is an actual threat to man's enjoyment of life, to his emotions, to his values. You have all heard such popular catchphrases as the cold hand of logic, men cannot live by logic, etc. Well, let us consider a few examples of how men do live and if there is such a thing as a cold hand that sweeps over their lives at time, leaving desolation in its wake. What is its nature and its cause? These examples are instances of the kind of suffering which, in one form or another, all men encounter in the course of their lives. Suppose you work in an office, you are doing an excellent job, and your boss praises you highly. But when the time comes for a promotion, he gives it to another man who is blatantly incompetent and undeserving. You are left with a bitter feeling of disappointment. If you try to find an explanation for the injustice, you will probably conclude that your boss was hypocritical or that he was cruel, or if your thinking is not too precise, you might go so far as to blame the capitalist system, deciding that all employers are hypocritical and cruel. What you probably will not realize is that hypocrisy and cruelty are not primaries and they explain nothing that they come from a deeper cause, and that the real essence of the boss's injustice toward you, the real root of his evil, was the fact that he acted illogically. Suppose you are in love with a girl and engaged to marry her. Suddenly, without warning or explanation, she refuses to see you or to answer the telephone when you call. A few months later, you learn that she had eloped with a man she had met the day before and had married on the whim of the moment. You might explain her behavior by concluding that she was dishonest or promiscuous or that all love and sex are evil. But the real cause and essence of her evil was that she had acted illogically. Suppose you are a research scientist and after years of desperately hard work, you succeeded in solving the problem that had been your goal. It is a great achievement and a great moment for you. You rush to the man who is your best friend to share the news with him. He listens indifferently, says, how nice, and proceeds to tell you the latest football scores he heard on television. You might explain it to yourself by concluding that he is insensitive or hypocritical or that true friendship is impossible among men. But the real cause and essence of his evil is that he had not given you any thought. He had acted illogically. If you look back and analyze any instances of disappointment, disillusionment, or suffering you have endured in your relationships with people, any harm or injury they have done to you, you will find that under all the other more superficial causes, the basic cause was their irrationality, their refusal to think, their lack of logic. Any feeling of bitterness, suspicion, futility that you may now have in regard to men, the feeling that it is hopeless to expect any fairness, kindness, or understanding from them, comes from the countless instances stored in your subconscious of the bewildering inconsistencies, contradictions, evasions, injustices you have encountered in dealing with people, instances of human irrationality, of the illogical demands made of you, 
of the illogical responses to you. And I venture to add regretfully, in such cases where you have caused pain or injury to others, you have done it by being irrational, by acting thoughtlessly, illogically. You have all heard the phrase so frequently used as a lament by altruists and humanitarians, man's inhumanity to man. I wish to state that the essence of this inhumanity, the factor responsible for it, is irrationality, and that no other single factor, not even deliberate sadism, has caused the suffering and destruction comparable to that caused by the irrationality of well-meaning, good-intentioned people in the history of mankind and in the personal histories of individual lives. The suffering that erodes and destroys man's spirit, undercuts his self-esteem, shrivels his ambition, wipes out his incentives, kills his enjoyment of life. The suffering that drains the enthusiasm of youth and brings an eager, curious, benevolent child to that state of gray, cynical lethargy, which in our present culture is regarded as adulthood. What is sadism when compared to that slow, daily, all-pervading process of murder in which well-meaning people are constantly engaged? Besides, sadism too is only the manifestation, the result of irrationality. The irrational is the unthinking. It is the willful defiance of reason. To act illogically, is to exhibit contradictions in one's behavior. Now, in this context, let me read to you again the quotation read in the first chapter, a quotation from Will Durant's popular story of philosophy, quote, But no man ever lived who could lift logic to a lofty strain. A guide to correct reasoning is as elevating as a manual of etiquette. We may use it, but it hardly spurs us to nobility. Not even the bravest philosopher would sing to a book of logic underneath the bow. Close quote. Ladies and gentlemen, Atlas Shrugged is a hymn to logic, to the power and importance of logic. You will have observed that the three parts of Atlas Shrugged are named after the three Aristotelian laws of logic, non-contradiction, either-or, A is A. The generally accepted dictionary definition of logic is the art of correct reasoning. This is true, but it is a description rather than a definition. It defines the field with which logic deals, the field of reasoning, but it leaves open the question of what is correct in reasoning. Ayn Rand has answered that question with a specific definition. Logic is the art of non-contradictory identification. The full importance of this definition will become clear to you as we discuss the nature of logic. In the process of acquiring knowledge, of moving from the perception of concretes and particulars to the formation of wider and wider abstractions and concepts, and in the applying of concepts to new particulars, new concretes, man's mind does not function infallibly. Error is possible to man. Therefore, man needs a standard by which he can judge the truth or falsehood of his conclusions, the validity or invalidity of his thinking. He does not possess such a standard automatically or innately. His mind must discover it. That standard is logic. Aristotle was the father of the science of logic, the first man who formulated the principles of correct thinking, the principles that all men must obey if the attainment of truth is their purpose. The three Aristotelian laws of logic are the law of identity, the law of contradiction, the law of excluded middle. The last two are merely corollaries or restatements of the first. The law of identity states that everything which is, is what it is, that a thing is itself, that a thing's identity is that which it is. In algebraic formulation, the law of identity is stated as A is A. The law of identity was discussed in the first lecture as the basic principle of metaphysics. It is crucially important now to realize that the law of identity is also the basic principle of epistemology. It is the link between the two sciences, the bridge between existence and consciousness, between reality and knowledge. As a principle of metaphysics, the law of identity tells us that everything which is, is what it is. As a principle of epistemology, it tells us that contradictions cannot exist, that a thing cannot be A and not A, and, therefore, if we reach a contradiction in our thinking and draw two contradictory conclusions about the same thing in the same context, we have made an error. Our thinking is wrong.